the class. So we're going to call this uh, lesson 16, which is going to cover the lecture 13 PowerPoints. Um, and I just wanted to note that the previous lecture on uh, massive parallel sequencing, uh, I didn't click on the record screen button when it was recording. So those videos are essentially mute. But you can go ahead and follow the links in the PowerPoint and then watch them on your own with in all of its glorious sound. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Um, so today's lecture is basically going to cover a lot of stuff we already know. Um, it's going to introduce a lot of terminology that you need to know because geneticists speak a different language. Um, and so basically we're going to talk about what's the difference between recessive and dominant mutations and, and how the terms go as far as, you know, if it's sufficient a mutation to produce the desired phenotypic effect or a mutant phenotypic effect. Okay, so this is nothing really new. We know that we have phenotypes and let's say that, you know, this is representing the the chromosomes. And we have a, one chromosome with a locus, right? And it has a allele. Then we have another one, and this is for, you know, some color, shape, whatever. And so this is going to produce an RNA, and we know that that RNA is going to produce a protein, and that protein is going to have a function. And that function is going to be dictated by its shape, right, whether it's color or uh, if it's going to do an enzymatic reaction or whatever. And then we're going to have another one. We're going to have two copies because we're diploid. And so that's also going to make an RNA, and that's going to make a protein, which is going to be a very similar protein, and probably maybe even exactly the same, and that's going to have a function. And that function is going to depend on the shape of this protein. And so... We basically have the same thing going on here, and that's what this represents. So one of these is representing whatever this is, we'll call it A, and plus indicates that it's functional. And then this one also means it's functional, so we have two copies of a functional, and we call this wild type. So, you know, we talked about this in, in Mendel's flowers, they're purple, or, you know, in... in uh, sickle cell anemia, this is normal shaped cells, or whatever. And then we have heterozygous. So we know that one of these works, and one of these is broken. So this one is functional, this one is, you know, we could put the minus there, but just not having it there means it's minus. <coughs> so maybe the promoter's broken, so we never get an RNA. Or maybe the RNA's made, but there's a mutation in the DNA that causes the RNA to change and we get uh, different amino acids put in here or you know from the last problem set it could be a stop codon uh, the start codon might start somewhere else so that might certainly change its shape which would affect its function so for any one of these steps could be broken and it doesn't really matter because in the end this enzyme or this protein, I guess I should, it could be any protein, like collagen, uh, is, is broken. And that's what this is signifying here. And in this case, we have both that are broken. So, so one is normal, right, in the heterozygote. So the one is normal and one is broken. And in these, they're both broken. So we, we don't get any protein made um, and so therefore we get the mutant phenotype. So you, you probably essentially know this and it's nothing new. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how this works. So there's a disease called PKU. Uh, it's phenylketonuria. Um, and it's caused by a recessive mutation in a gene called PAH. So here's PAH that's on this chromosome. 
here's the locus and it produces a enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase and so in the original slide if you looked at it as a slideshow this wouldn't be here um, so it's making phenylalanine hydroxylase normally now if that gene is broken or mutated and it could be anything it could be the promoter it could be a stop codons inserted it could be a frame shift whatever it's not going to make uh, a functional phenylalanine hydroxylase. So that's what this X represents right here. What phenylalanine hydroxylase does is it does exactly what the name says. So it takes phenylalanine So it takes, it takes phenylalanine uh, that you have in your food and it hydroxylases it. So ACE means it's an enzyme and basically it means it's, it's going to add a hydroxyl group. Now if you don't know, if you, I mean I teach this in basic 181, the, it's one of the major functional groups and it's simply an OH group. By adding this hydroxyl group to phenylalanine that makes tyrosine. So it's taking phenylalanine from your food and converting it into tyrosine um, and that is used for other metabolic processes that we're not really going to get into. This is like a biochemistry thing but that's basically what's going on. Now if this doesn't function, it doesn't make tyrosine, it makes phenylpyruvic acid. And this compound is toxic. So in Arizona, when a child is born, they test it for the PAH gene to make sure that this is functional. And the reason they do is because if they don't, these children that are born with PKU get very sick and die. Um, and this could simply be eliminated by eliminating giving that baby food that has phenylalanine in it and therefore this is not made and so it, it saves you know millions and millions of dollars for states that would have to take care of these children otherwise but you know instead of just simply altering their diet okay so this is a recessive mutation because you have two of these genes and so the other one could function and may, it would make half the amount but you'd still make tyrosine this w chemical wouldn't be made uh, certainly wouldn't be made at a high enough volume to really cause anything so that's why it's a recessive mutation um, so PKU that we just talked about like a lot of other uh, recessive phenotypes is caused by loss of function mutation. So a loss of function mutation simply means what it says that it's lo lost its function uh, because of you know some mutation in the DNA. So maybe the promoter doesn't work right and so the genes never read or you know any anything that could cause it to lose its normal function. Now there are some mutations that, that are, we consider hypomorphic mutations. So hypo means low, like hypoglycemic. And so that means that it lowers the normal function. So that means that uh, if you have this mutation that you're going to get less of the protein and because there's less of the protein you're going to get less function. Just like if half of your workers at your factory quit, you would get less production of whatever product you're making. A null mutation means that it doesn't work at all. It's completely lost all its function. So a uh, loss of function could be hypomorphic, where it just reduces the function, or a null mutation and that we already talked about, that it's lost all of its function. Those are terms that you need to no, so make flashcards or whatever you need to do uh, to remember it. 
So I put this up here just to remind you that there are different kinds of amino acids and we generally group them in categories. So I'm not going to, this is not a biochemistry class. I'm not trying to get you to memorize all of these uh, 20 different amino acids. But what I want you to know is that the, we classify them. So some are aromatic, some are acidic, uh, some are amide, some are basic, uh, some are hydrophobic, right? And some are neutrophilic. Um, and so, and we've already talked about that. So, the, so the, if you have a mutation that converts one amino acid into another, like let's say aspartic acid, that's acidic, right? It says it in its name, glutamic acid, that's also acidic. So if this were converted into this, it might not have such a major change in the shape of the protein. But if this were converted into this, it probably would have a big change in the in the function of the especially if it occurred in the functional group in the in the active site which is the site where the reaction occurs in case you didn't know that from intro bio okay and then you know since we're on this slide you can see here's phenylalanine right so we talked about uh hydroxylase so here's a this is the hydroxyl group and you can see the difference between these two amino acids is simply that hydroxyl group. So that's what that enzyme does. It takes phenylalanine, adds a hydroxyl to it, and then converts that to tyrosine. They're both aromatic, so um, a mutation in that wouldn't be a big deal, but not, not being able to do this conversion because you, uh, your PAH genes, both of them are messed up, um, you would get uh, that buildup of toxic components that would cause you to be ill. Okay, so again, I'm not asking you to memorize the amino acid table. I'm not even asking you to categorize them. If you take biochemistry, you'll have to do that, but this isn't a biochemistry class. It's genetics. All right, so a null, null mutation that causes PKU, and this simply is just showing you what the mutation is. So normally the it, uh, it has a normally pH gene normally so that's what plus means it's normal it makes phenylalanine hydroxylase which we all have seen is adds a OH group to phenylalanine to make it tyrosine so this is the nucleotide sequence this is the amino acid sequence you guys are familiar with this and here we've had have it, it converted into a stop codon uh, and so it truncates this, and so we have uh, this transition, this single transition causes a nonsense mutation, which causes that to have a loss of function. And then just so you can see, uh, this is what we're talking about. So this is amino acid 261. Um, that converts um, arginine, which is the single letter character um, Right here so arginine single letter character is R and so that's this designation is telling me it's the PAH gene this R is arginine and then 261 tells me it's at amino acid number 261 and that's turned into an X which is a stop codon so it's truncating that uh, original protein all right, so sickle cell anemia, also known as sickle cell disease, is a mutation in the beta subunit of hemoglobin. So just in case you don't know, there's two alphas and two beta subunits of hemoglobin. Oh, sorry, this is an alpha, this is an alpha. And so all four of these, you need four subunits to make a functional oxygen carrying hemoglobin protein right it's uh, got a quaternary structure because it's made up of more than two or more uh subunits all right okay so whereas we had the PKU mutation in the PAH gene, um, which is phenylalanine hydroxylase. So that 
truncated the protein, right? Created a stop codon where it was, wasn't supposed to have one. And so that created a null mutation, right? That, that protein does not function. So let's just go back so that we can cover this again. All right, so null mutation, all of its function, right? The PKU truncated does not function at all. Um, it does not have the right shape, and so it's completely broken. So that's a null mutation. Sickle cell disease is a little different. Um, this is a hypomorphic. So remember, hypo means low, like a, like a hypoglycemia. That means low sugar. So a hypomorphic mutation causes sickle cell disease. And so in this case, we have uh, this single amino acid, uh, glutamic acid, converted to valine here. And there's the mutation. You can see it. Um, and so that's a single transversion. And we all know transversions and transition. So that causes valine to be substituted for uh, glutamic acid. So what that does is it changes the shape <clears throat> just enough to cause the hemoglobin to not be able to bind oxygen that well. And so kind of you can kind of think of it as a balloon. So when you have oxygen bound in there, it's kind of blown up and it's nice and round shaped. Uh, but if it doesn't have a high enough oxygen load, then it will collapse. And that causes the cell to have a sickle shape. So... This is the normal allele designated as A, um, and uh, this is the uh, mutated allele, which is designated as S for sickle cell. Okay, so we've talked about loss of function mutations, right? They can, they can be null, or they can be... Um, hypomorphic right so hypo means low um, loss of function mutations are recessive if the normal allele is haplo sufficient so in so the word haplo means single or simple um, and so it it just means basically if if the normal allele is singly a, a sufficient to create a normal phenotype which is a fancy way of saying you just need one copy of the allele to create a normal phenotype, which we know. Um, but this is how geneticists talk, so you need to know what this word means. Um, okay, so we have this makes a functional pro product. We've kind of already gone over this. So, um, I don't want to beat, beat a dead horse. So this is going to be a normal protein. This one's going to be non-functional. But we get the normal phenotype because... It's haplosufficient. We only need half or, you know, whatever is, is being produced is enough to produce the normal phenotype. And in this case, this would, can you guess uh, what it would be called? It would be haplo, well, it, it, it wouldn't be haploinsufficient. That would be haploinsufficient if the heterozygote wasn't enough to rescue it. So that would be a dominant. Uh, phenotype. All right. So here's a dominant mutation um, where we have two normal alleles cause a normal phenotype, but only one mu uh, mutant allele, broken allele, causes the mutant. And then here we also have the mutant phenotype. So uh, this would be considered haplo insufficient because it's singly insufficient to rescue. Uh, to the wild or normal phenotype. Okay. So we've talked about loss of function mutations. We've, we've talked about them as being null um, or hypomorphic. 
we've talked about them as being haplosufficient or haploinsufficient. And so, and we've given examples of them. So this is an example of a loss of function. So the mutation causes the protein to not be functional in mice in their coat color. So mice that have, that are homozygous. Okay, mice that are homozygous uh, are dark brown, right? M mice that have a yellow, one single yellow allele and a normal dark brown allele are yellowish mice. And so the A plus allele by itself is haplo insufficient. It means it cannot produce the normal dark coat color in a sufficient quantity to make the mouse have that phenotype. So that's considered, since there's only one mutant that causes the mutant phenotype, then that's considered a loss of function. And then because there's only one, it's dominant. <clears throat> so here's an example of haplo insufficiency. Right, so when we we haplo is single, right? It's it's singly insufficient. In other words, the heterozygote is not does not make a sufficient amount where the protein isn't sufficiently functional to rescue the wild type or normal uh, phenotype. So let's talk a little bit about LDL. So hopefully in, you know, intro bio, you, you talked to, about um, cholesterol because, we, and this should have been in a lipid chapter. I mean, almost every intro biology book is going to have a chapter on macromolecules and cholesterol is almost always covered in the lipid chapter. So cholesterol is a lipid. It's not water soluble. And so, therefore, you can't just have cholesterol going through your bloodstream. It would not dissolve. And that would be kind of bad. So, the way that it's carried is on LDL. So, LDL stands for low-density lipoprotein. <clears throat> right. It's, so... A lipoprotein is a protein that has a lipid attached to it. It's not cholesterol itself. Um, and then hopefully, again, you learn from 181 or intro biology that cholesterol is required to maintain lipid, uh, uh, the membrane fluidity. Because when it gets cold outside, fats get harder. And when it gets warm, they get more liquidy. And so you have channels in all of your cells and they transport specific things. So if this gets harder, it would be like squishing a door frame. You might not fit through it anymore. Or if it gets too loose, it might open the door too much and let anything in. And then it wouldn't be able to maintain homeostasis. So your membrane has to stay a, a constant uh, fluidity of about the consistency of vegetable oil that you'd find on this shelf at Walmart. And to, to change that, you like plants can change their uh, fatty acid tails. So just a, another reminder of lipids. So we have triglycerides. And those have three fatty acid tails. Okay? These are not water soluble this is a glycerol head and so uh, we can bend these tails plants can by adding a double bond in there so we add a double bond in there it makes it kinked and it spreads it out so it makes it more liquid kind of like if you had a snowball if you wanted to make it harder you'd compress it and so same thing with fats you want to make them harder then you make them straight tails you want to make them uh, more liquid, then you spread them out and make them bent tails. So think about this. Uh, this is a what we call unsaturated. 
because it doesn't have a total high number of hydrogens because it has double bonds in it. It could be anywhere. I'm just making it up. Um, and then this would be saturated. So animals don't have unsaturated fats. The way that we make these tails bend is we shove cholesterol in here and it physically spreads them out. So it's kind of like unpacking a snowball. And that's going to make it less dense, more liquid, uh, so that when we go outside and it's cold, we add more cholesterol. And most foods that you eat that are high in cholesterol, and, and of course, uh, they're going to be animal foods, they're going to, they're going to be from cold environments generally, uh, because that's when you need more cholesterol. So anyway, you need cholesterol. You need it to maintain membrane fluidity. Cholesterol is the root of all hormones. So we're talking about estrogen, testosterone, uh, any androgen, steroids, uh, glucocorticoid, anti-inflammatory, all of those. All of those are made from cholesterol. So you need a certain amount of cholesterol and you need a certain amount of LDL. Otherwise, you wouldn't maintain, be able to maintain homeostasis and you wouldn't have any hormonal signals so you would basically be dead or non-functional now uh how so these are floating around in your blood on ldl particles which is shown here and when the cell needs cholesterol it this these ldl particles bind to a receptor that receptor is brought into the cell this is called receptor mediated endocytosis and if you forgot that from intro bio look it up and this goes into an endosome, which is then go, uh, goes through the lysosome because you you want everything to go through the lysosome. And hopefully you remember this from 181. The lysosome is the stomach of the cell. So everything you want to put through the lysosome because you don't know what it is. It could be a virus. It could be a bacteria. And then it's released as cholesterol. So this is how you get uh, cholesterol that you need for both membrane fluidity and hormonal synthesis into the cell. And then this gets sent back out and the receptor is there again and then we get another LDL and so on and so forth. So this is a normal amount of cholesterol, right? And this is just showing mutations that would affect uh, the amount of cholesterol that's in your blood. And when I say cholesterol, I mean LDL, low density lipoprotein. I totally fell under that spell myself. All right, so there's so what I'm showing you here is there's lots of different mutations, right? These are the exon numbers. These are the mutations that can occur uh, that cause this familial hypercholesterolemia. Hyper means high, right? Like a hyperactive kid. And then cholesterolemia means LDL, right? High cholesterol. And this is from only having a single good copy of the LDL receptor gene. So the receptor here, right? If you only have one copy, then you can only bring in half the amount of LDL. And so if you're only bringing half the amount of LDL, you would expect the LDL in your blood to go up, right? Because it's not going into your cell. It's kind of like having low amounts of insulin are going to increase the amounts of sugar in your blood because insulin uh, brings sugar into the cell, out of your blood. All right. Okay. So the next kind of mutation we're going to talk about is a dominant negative mutation. Um, Sometimes these are referred to as spoiler mutations because generally this mutation interferes with the normal functioning protein. And the way that it does this um, is that it binds. So let's say, you know, we talked about hem hemoglobin. So we talked about hemoglobin, right? It needs, uh, so it's got a quaternary structure. It means two or more subunits to make a functional, um, in that case, it's a 
a tetramer because it's four units. This is a dimer, which means two, and maris is part. So die is two, maris equals part. So it needs two parts to make it fully functional. In this case, um, this dominant negative mutation, this mutation here has the area it needs to bind to the other subunit, but the other part of it is not functional, so it doesn't work. And so what that does is, because we need both of these together to make it fully functional, when this is made, it binds to the good one and wrecks it, which is why it gets the name spoiler. Now, okay, so there, so we're going to talk a little bit about loss of function and gain of function. So we already talked talked about loss of function. This kind of mutation is known as a gain of function because the actual term means that it has gained, uh, so the altered gene product has some sort of new molecular shape or function or even a new pattern of expression of that gene. Um, and so that's what is defined as a gain of function mutation. So this is indeed a gain of function because it's an altered, I know that it's weird, it's an altered uh, or a new function or a new pattern. Um, and these are gain of function mutations are always, almost always dominant functions. Um, so <clears throat> I hope that that makes sense. I know that it's, you're like, oh yeah, it's wrecked, but it's really wrecking the other one. So it's not just wrecking itself. That would be a, a loss of function, right? If it, But because it's dimerizing and it's ruining the other molecule too, then it's considered a gain of function, even though it's lost its function. I know it's confusing, but that's just the terminology that geneticists use. And so we're just going to have to go with it. Okay, pseudochondroplasia, it's also known as dwarfism, is caused by a dominant negative mutation. Um, and you, you probably know the effects of short limbs, normal uh, head and face, usually some mild scoliosis or curvature of the spine, and so on. I don't, I don't care if you know this. So this is how this functions. And so we have a protein called a comp protein, which is cartilage oligomeric matrix protein. And so the comp protein is made up, just like we just talked about, of different subunits. In this case, it's a pentamer, so it's made up of five. And it shows you that right there in that red circle. Um, so here's the comp uh, protein. It has five subunits. And so this produces um, cartilage matrix, right? So here's some cartilage, um, but the, and that's expressed out. So normally the comp protein would be able to leave the, the cell that produces cartilage. So in a normal uh, comp protein that's being produced, it gets excreted into the extracellular matrix the area between cells by the chondrocytes or specialized cells that produce uh, cartilage. Um, and then car cartilage is, uh, this produces other cells to make this, and then this is a, plays a key role. I don't, it doesn't really matter. It, it plays a key role in cartilage production. And so what happens in this mutation is that this comp protein uh, is misshapen, so it cannot go through the cell and be exported, and therefore it doesn't end up in the extracellular matrix. These cells get filled with comp protein, um, and then eventually they die. And when these cells die, you get uh, a failure of cartilage to be produced. So 
in the end, these pentamers get stuck inside the cell. Um, that produces the the extracellular matrix of cartilage and eventually kills the cell. So you get less cartilage. Hopefully that makes sense. So here's some dominant mutations that show a gain of function. And just so you know, this is another term that we use so that this term is neomorphic. Where this one is called antimorphic. So this is neo is new, right? New morph, new type. So this is a dominant mutation that shows a gain of function. Um, again, you know, you would think that it's not really a gain of function, but remember the definition of gain of function. So here we have a gene called antennapedia. And antennapedia is involved in the fruit fly Drosophila development. And we're going to talk about this when we get to the development of genetics. Uh, but there's a crazy mutation that, that, that fruit fly biologists recognize quite early uh, in studying the genetics of fruit flies. And what happens in this mutation, and this is why it's called antennapedia, uh, so antenna and pedia, right, like a podiatrist is foot. So basically it's this name means that you have a foot, antenna foot, a uh, mutant. <laughs> So here we have a normal antenna. Here we have a foot that replaces an antenna. And so that is called antennapedia. This is a dominant mutation uh, that causes the flies to grow legs uh, where the antenna normally would be. And so because this is an acquiring of a new function, it's called neomorphic, new type. All right, so this is the Antenniapedia complex. There's a lot of genes involved here, and like I don't care that you know this immediately. Um, I'm just trying to go over examples of different uh, dominant gain of function mutations. So this is a fruit fly's body plan, and it doesn't really matter that uh, there's a thorax and an abdomen. So T is thorax. does not like me writing on this a is abdomen and so that's what these segments are and so normally in the antennapedia complex it suppresses feet uh, the gene that produces feet in the antenna so we don't get antenna right so t2 normally expressed uh, in the thoracic area two uh, is active in the head. So normally this gene would be suppressed. Now it's active. So therefore we have the gain of function because it's normally suppressed. And in that instance, it, the fly ends up getting a, a leg that would normally grow there uh, if it wasn't being suppressed by Antenna, the antennapedia gene. Okay. So I'm going to summarize this in a minute. I just want to make sure that you guys know this. We've already talked about this, but we know about incomplete dominance, and we talked about four clocks. So we have red, and then we have the heterozygote, which is pink, and then the homozygous recessive, which is white. You know that that's a one to two to one ratio, hopefully. Um, where one-fourth is red, uh, two-fourths are pink, and one-fourth is white when we have a mono hybrid cross. So this is nothing new. We've already kind of covered this. We talked about codominance, um, and this will probably help with a, a little bit with your... Um, your forensic detective determining who the baby's daddy is 
But we've already talked about this, and if you're not sure, you can go back and look at the lecture. But codominance is when both are expressed, and we talked about there can be a receptor that's A-shaped and a receptor that's B-shaped. And we could have both receptors at the same time, so that would be AB. We could have no receptors, so it could just be a naked cell surface, and that would be O blood type. And then we talked about there's a, a thing called RH factor. So either either you have that receptor, so let's just say that this is an RH receptor, or you don't, right? It's not there. So you could be, uh, you, you have blood your blood type, which would be A, B, or O, or it could be A, B, all right? Then you have your RH factor, which is your rhesus factor, um, and that's either plus or minus, so either you have the receptor or you don't. So that's where you get your O negative or AB positive or whatever. And then there's another blood group called MN, um, and then you could have it either M or N or MN, uh, and without going into too much crazy detail about the MN groups, um, you could be M plus or M minus or N plus or N minus. But generally we just say you're either M or N. So this would be codominant, this would be codominant, this would be codominant because they can all be expressed together at the same time. Slide, thank you. All right. So we've already talked about this. Incomplete dominance is an intermediate between the two homozygotes, uh, the dominant and the recessive. Codominance is they're both fully expressed. Now, if you got down to the molecular level, this would be a completely gray area, but we're talking about on an actual like phenotypic level that we could see or detect in an easy way. All right, so summarize. So we have loss of function, right? That means we lose the function of that protein for whatever reason. Um, so we can we can get a hypomorphic, right, which reduces the function, or we can get a null, which completely loses the function. Um, so you know what we've talked about is Mendel's flower color, which is a null loss of function. Um, we talked about PKU, which is also a null loss of function. So that disease, so uh, the PAH gene, the phenylalanine hydroxylase, those are null loss of function mutation. So then we also have the hypomorph, which means that it's a reduced function. We talked about that. So an example of that would be sickle cell anemia. And then we have gain of function. So some of these seem weird because they might not be really gaining a function because it seems like you're losing something but you have to go by the definition of that <coughs> excuse me all right so we have an increase in the protein's function which is hypermorphic uh, gain of function um, and that's a protein that interferes with the wild type protein function so uh, like pseudochondroplasia, uh, it's an antimorphic dominant negative mutation. So in this case, it's uh, an antimorph and it's dominant negative. So remember, dominant negatives are spoilers that we talked about in pseudochondroplasia with the comp. Um, and it's antimorphic because an, an antimorph, although it's really relatively rare, uh, is dominant and opposite or opposing to the wild type function. So like an anti-hero or whatever. Um, and then we have a neomorph and a neomorph, it produces a active product with a new different function. Uh, something that the wild type allele doesn't do. Uh, and so these are kind of 
a little confusing, but ho hopefully you can sit down and and go over these individually from the lecture and then uh, correspondingly sort them into categories. So we have gain of function, loss of function, and then we have hypermorph, so that means that there's more product being made. We have antimorph, which means that it's a dominant negative spoiler. Um, and so that's going to reduce, sorry. That's going to reduce uh, the function, right, because it's going to interfere with it. And then we have a neomorph, which is a gain of function, but that function is generally different than the original function. Okay. <clears throat> So I think that you kind of realize that the distinction between loss of function and gain of function isn't really super clear. Uh, but loss of function usually means that less of the protein is made or <coughs> some function of the protein has been compromised. Loss of function mutations are generally recessive as opposed to dominant. And generally a single good copy can overcome the loss of a or yeah the loss of a single bad copy um, there are exceptions to that though and we talked about haplo insufficiency so one copy is not enough and dominant negative or antimorphic mutations where the defective gene uh, messes with the function of the wild type copy generally this is uh, occurs when we're talking about uh, multimeric proteins, um, like ones with a quaternary structure, uh, and those are the examples that we used today. So let's just summarize allelic interactions. I mean, recessive mutations are typical loss of function uh, in haplosufficient genes. The example we used is PKU or phenylalanine um, hydroxylase, the, the PAH gene that causes the disease PKU. Fully dominant mutations are often loss of function mutations in haploinsufficient genes. So we talked about mice color and familial hypercholesterolemia. Hyper Fully dominant mutations can also involve a gain of function. So we talked about antennapedia, where the feet are replacing antennas and the fruit fly, or a dominant negative effect on the function of a normal allele. And we talked about pseudochondroplasia or dwarfism, and that caused by that, that pentamer comp protein. A mutation showing incomplete dominance has a partial phenotypic effect uh, in heterozygotes, right? And a much larger effect in homozygotes, which is, uh, we talked about, it's um, incomplete dominance, right? So we have the red, pink, and white flowers. Codominant alleles show a full phenotypic effect independently of the effects of other alleles. So uh, the example that we've already used and we've used again is the blood groups. All right. Okay, so you know that genes can have more than two alleles. We talked about this with hair color, you know, we have multiple alleles, um, skin color and humans, whatever. So sometimes that you can have a hierarchical effect in genes when you have more than uh, two alleles involved. So a good example of this is rabbits. And so we have... Uh, uh, we're just going to use the regular C F for color. Um, and so this mutation would cause it to lack color. So it would be an albino where it would have white hairs all over its body. Uh, Himalayan or Himalayan, however you want to say it. Uh, this we designate as H. 
and so it has black hairs on the extremities like feet and ears um, and white hair everywhere else we have uh, ch which we designate chinchella so white hair with black tips on the body giving it a gray appearance uh, and then uh, we have the normal wild type, which is just going to be indicated with C+. So colored hairs over the entire body. In this case, it's just brown rabbit. All right. Um, so like we said, we can have a dominance hierarchy or a little like series over these um, uh, alleles, right? So in this case, the uh, if we had something that was colorless, and it was a heterozygous with colored, this would be tr would trump that. If we had something that were was this and this, then this one trumps the homo the chinchilla trumps the homolian, right? And so we have this dominance hierarchy that tells you what the outcome of these rabbits are going to be. So here we have C plus and C. That's going to be wild type. C plus and CH, right? C plus is dominant, so it's still going to be wild type. Uh, C plus and H, it's going to be wild type. So this allele trumps every other allele that it has as a heterozygote here. And of course, C plus and C plus is also going to be wild type. So here we have a heterozygote that's chinchilla, and this, right, this is going to be dominant over this one so it's going to be uh, lightly chinchilla I mean let's just we'll just call it chinchilla I'm not going to get really this distinctive but to kind of give you an idea and then we have chinchilla and uh, homolian so light chinchilla with black tits but in this example you know we're going to kind of forget about this like sort of blending thing and we're just going to say okay this supersedes this and this and this uh, okay, we talked about pleiotropy, and uh, so this is just a review. So remember, pleiotropy means that uh, a single mutation has multiple phenotypic effects. And PK, PKU, the PAH gene that we just talked about, um, it, it, it produces melanin, and so that can affect your skin color as well. Um, so if you have... Uh, if you're homozygous recessive for PKU, you have light colored hair and blue eyes because this pathway is broken down. Okay, so we're going to talk about penetrance. So this is kind of interesting. You can have two individuals that have the same genotype, but a different phenotype. Um, and so penetrance is simply the proportion of individuals with a certain genotype that sows the phenotype associated with it. And you can have incomplete penetrance. Whoops. We can have incomplete penetrance, which means that uh, some individuals fail to show the phenotype associated with the trait at all. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Okay, so, so if we looked at the popu a population um, let's say this population W, and we're, I'm, we're just going to say it's an A allele, right? So let's say that we have a big A, big A, big A, little A, little A, little A, right? And so in this case, you would expect that most individuals would show the the phenotypic variation, right? That, that their phenotype would be different than wild type because they're homozygous recessive, right? So if we so if if we looked at a population, um, and that population has the genotype AA, right? So we're just looking. Let's say we're looking at a hundred people, and all these people have little a little a but only 95 percent of them display the phenotype so let's just say that this is i don't know let's just call it purple flowers so 
if we had a hundred individuals that were little a little a and we would expect them sorry this is probably a bad example let's let's use white flowers instead I'm trying to keep do something that you're familiar with so we'll say that this is white flowers uh, okay so and if if we had a hundred percent penetrance that means all of these individuals would have white flowers but let's say of these 90 of these 100 only 95 actually have white flowers and 5% have purple flowers so in this case when we say 95% display that phenotype right in this case it would be white flowers cuz little a little a is what we defined as white flowers and 5% do not so they show purple flowers then the condition has 95% penetrance that means that it's penetrating to 95% of the population and any time that we have less than 100% we say that that's incomplete penetrance so in our world of Mendel that would be complete penetrance but that's not always the case so if we we could look at breast the breast cancer gene right so this so just because you have the breast cancer gene doesn't mean that you're going to develop breast cancer and so that means that it has an incomplete penetrance so if we looked at individuals with breast cancer um, and this is a one of the breast cancer genes uh, BRCA1 so if let's say you detected that you had BRCA1 or if we or we surveyed 100 individuals with BRCA1 mutation 55% um, of those would develop the phenotype which would be breast cancer um, and 45% would not get breast cancer Well, then the print penetrance of this is 55% for BRCA1. And you'd, you'd have to be heterozygous for this. So it would be like little b, little b, if you want to use that uh, nomenclature. Uh, all right, so let's say there, so just, you know, that there's a correlation between breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, and this is why Angelina Jolie had a mastectomy and also a hysterectomy at the same time so that she wouldn't get ovarian cancer because she's homozygous for the BRCA1 uh, mutation. So anyway, if, if we looked at this uh, for ovarian cancer, 39% of people with BRCA1 would develop ovarian cancer. Remember, this is homozygous recessive. Um, so that would mean that 61% uh, of would not. And so this would be 39% penetrance for ovarian cancer, right? And this value of penetrance can also vary with age. The older you are, the higher the penetrance for this, um, because you're accumulating more mutations. Okay, and the reason that this has a different penetrance is because there is more than one gene involved in breast cancer. So let's say that you had ten genes, and we talked a little bit about this. And let's say that you had mutations in nine genes. You just got unlucky. And your parents, you know, pass those on to you. So you're just one gene from getting cancer. And you already have the BRCA1. But let's say uh, the gene that's functional is BRCA2. And this is the one that get, needs to get mutated to give you breast cancer. So let's say you smoked a lot of cigarettes. Maybe a twin or somebody else didn't. Well, you would get breast cancer because you've increased your probability of getting mutation in this gene which is one of the ten genes to, that leads you on the pathway or maybe you just got unlucky and your DNA made a mistake when it replicated and caused this mutation in this so you got breast cancer 
But regardless, you're going to have different individuals in a population that are going to get mutations in this and not. And some of them are going to ex express the phenotype. And that's how we get variable penetrance in a population. So it's kind of what I was just explaining. Penetrance is a combination of genetic factors, environmental factors. Like many of the geneticists, we don't really completely understand that. Um, we don't know what half of the genes in the human genome do yet. So a lot of these things we com we're, we're completely unfamiliar with, and that's why there's lots of research into various fields. Um, so because some people get it and some people don't, it isn't always cut and dry. It makes it difficult for geneticists to figure out the risk of passing on a genetic condition when it involves penetrance. Um, and any of these factors, right, we talked about it. Like So anything that could increase your risk of mutations, and in fact, it doesn't even have to be a mutation, right? So let's just say you have this. And this gene read, I don't know, it made black paint, for example. Well, if your chromosome was condensed, even though you had this signal, it could never be read. And so there are things that condense your chromosome, like methylation and acetylation, that can affect whether or not chromosomes are condensed or not. And environmental factors like smoking, could it, this could cause this. And then this, this could even be done by your parents or your grandparents. So even though you might have a very functional copy of black paint, if you can't read it, you're not going to make black paint, even though it's fully functional and perfectly good. So uh, that can also affect uh, penetrance. So that's what we're talking about. Epigenetic is above genetics, and we've talked about this already. We have a gene. That gene um, is controlled by transcriptional factors. We talked about that, and it's going to turn that into an RNA. And then we process that RNA, right? So we turn that into an mRNA. And then maybe it's easier to do, use this instead of the pen since it's on a blue background. So we can control transcription, right? Is the promoter good? Are all the transcription factors there? Are we going to get the gene turned on? Then we get the transcript, but we still have to process it. We have to cut out the introns and exons. We're going to we're going to keep the exons. We're going to cut out the introns, and then uh, you know we're going to uh, rearrange those. We got to put the cap on and the tail on for eukaryotes. Um, and then once once it's made into a functional mRNA, it gets transported out where it's read by a ribosome. Um, you know, there are different translational controls that can affect this if it's translated right. Uh, once it's translated, it gets folded into a protein. Maybe it gets phosphorylated, uh, and so it makes it active. Maybe it's not phosphorylated, so it's inactive. So there are all kinds of different things that can control uh, whether or not, in the end, we get an active functional protein. And I'm not going to show this video just for the interest of time, but this is quite an interesting uh, video on epigenetics. And they talk about, uh, so I'm pretty sure it's it's uh, narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, and he's talk they're following a couple of twins that have different genetic outcomes as far as cancer and then they kind of explore why and there's some mice that have uh some epigenetic factors then they show that just their diet can affect the, how their genes are expressed so it's kind of cool if you're interested in, in epigenetics um i, th I think it's worth a, a look all right, where are we? Okay, so, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about epigenetics later, but it's it's kind of like a new field in genetics, um, and we're looking at it to try to understand this, this penetrance and how things in the environment can affect whether or not we get a, a phenotypic variation. So we can predict that. So we can tell people, hey, 
there's a you know certain percent of chance that your kid is going to have the breast cancer gene and percent of chance that they're going to get breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and how that works. All right, so we have penetrance, and then we also have something called expressivity. So expressivity is uh, the degree to which a particular genotype is expressed in a phenotype. So the expression of that phenotype can vary even though individuals have the exact same genotype. Um, and so dogs are an example of this. So even though all of these dogs have the exact same gene genotype, uh, you know, they're, they're basically clonals, or if you inbreed animals long enough, you will, you will make them clonal copies of them. I'm probably going to give you a problem set to, sh to prove that to you because it's hard to kind of believe, but it, it's, a, it does occur. <coughs> and geneticists do that all the time. So we just inbreeding, backbreeding over and over and over again, you'll end up with a pure line at about 20 or 30 back crosses and that's hard to do with people but it's really easy to do with fruit flies because their gestation is only like five days okay so anyway so unlike penetrance expressivity describes uh the variation in individuals not the variability among a population like we talked about with breast cancer So, all right, so let's just talk about some examples of this. So we know, we know what uh, incomplete penetrance is, and we know how to calculate that. Uh, but what is variable expressivity? And so let's look at a study of individuals. There's 42 individuals that have a dominant allele uh, that causes polydactyly. So polydactyly is extra digits. On the fingers or toes. Um, so they have this dominant allele, right? Let's just say it's this. So let's just say, well, let me make it P. So let's say it's P. So if you have big P, you're you're gonna have your polydactylus. Um, little P doesn't matter, right? This is a dominant, so so this you're gonna be polydactylus. This you're gonna be polydactylus. This is your not. So if we look at uh, of these 42, 38 of them have extra digits on their fingers or toes. Remember, this is dominance. So if I ask you on the test or any geneticist asks you, what's the penetrance value? Well, remember, penetrance is how many individuals show the phenotype from the population you're observing. So 42, uh, so 38 out of these 42 individuals show uh, the f phenotype. And so that, if we did the math, that would be 0.9 per, uh, 0.9 or, uh, 90%. So the penetrance would be 90%. Okay. So to understand variable expressivity, we can look at polydactylous individuals. So some people are polydactylous and they have fully functioning fingers and toes, right? So a full on extra, you know, so let's say f normal five fingers, you have six fingers, you know, there are some very famous guitarists that have an extra finger and you can see where that would be uh, advantageous. Other people just have like maybe an, a little bump on the skin uh, that might not even really show that much, but it's still, uh, is caused by that gene that causes them to be polydactylous. And that's what we mean by variable expressivity. So here you could see uh, this person has a full-on extra finger. 
uh, and here it's not so obvious. Right? This this individual has quite a lot of polydactyly going on here, but this is not as expressive as having a full-on functional finger, if that makes sense. So uh, we can have variable penetrance. That means that not all individuals are actually going to, with the same genotype, are going to express the phenotype. We can have variable expressivity where that uh, we have variations in how much they express of that phenotype. And then we can have both. So that is essentially the difference between uh, penetrance and expressive expressivity. All right, so I'm going to end the lecture here and then uh, in a couple days, I'll make another lecture. Let me just see where we're we at. Um, so I think that would be lecture 14. So there are two more lectures um, that are covered on the next exam. And so that is going to be the PowerPoint 14, which is population genetics, and then 15, which is quantitative genetics. So I'm going to post those two lectures uh, probably this week. And then I'm also going to post another problem set when your other problem set is due. So that will be problem set five, which will cover uh, the chapters that we haven't, which is uh, the lecture 13, 14 and 15, which is the one we just did. And then I'll also post a quiz on those three chapters as well. And that will cover everything for your second exam. Um, and that'll give you a little over two weeks to finish all that. Um, so. Anyway, that's the game plan, um, and then uh, I'll post another video soon. If you have any questions, email me, come to office hours, whatever.